This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street. When you open, uh, when you open the Bible, how do you read it? Do you allow it to ask the questions or do you ask the questions? I find that I'm hardwired to be a biblical preacher. By that I believe that to the depths of my being that God speaks to us through this book. So when I open the Bible, I come with an attitude of expectant listening, waiting for the Word of God to speak through the words on the biblical page, convinced that the questions God raises in the scriptures are more searching and insightful than the questions I might bring. The Bible is not an encyclopedia where we look up answers to our questions. It is the Word of God where we listen to hear God's questions and answers. You might be of the opposite sort and open the Bible convinced that it holds the answers to all our questions or that it will debate with you about right and wrong or that it will explain the fine points of our existence. You can make a case for that too. But I begin with the Bible's words and the Bible's questions. This means therefore that as one of your pastors, I rarely flip to the index in the back of the Bible to find the subject that brought me to church this morning. I'm much more likely to begin by opening the Bible, convinced that you and I should hear first what is on God's mind. Jeremiah the prophet was hardwired the same way. He knew that the times in which he lived were hard and fraught with difficulties. He knew that people needed to hear the words of encouragement and hope from their preacher, not words of correction and judgment. But he found himself constrained to speak the word of the Lord as it came to him, knowing that it would not be welcomed as he knew, as, as, as only a pastor can, that his words brought confusion and distress to those who heard him. He could only hope somewhere in their confusion and distress that people would also hear God's word speaking the truth about them and pointing them to a brighter future. Dr. B. Davy Napier, one of the speakers on the Disciple Bible Study videos, caught this in his poetry, The Burning in the Bones. This book is a series of poems which seek to express the soul of Jeremiah. Here's an example. We're Jeremiah more than most, we are gregarious. And more than most, we know the longing to be heard, accepted, loved. Intensely people, people. We would like to speak the smooth, the sparkling, pleasing word, the soothing word, the word of confidence, the undisturbing word, the word of praise for sacred things like life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And truth, of course, America the beautiful, in God we trust, and in the Pentagon, Apollo, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. And Jesus saves the democratic way of life, and every day and in every way, grow old along with me because the best is surely yet to be in this fair land possessed by people who are brave and free. A little later, Dr. Napier goes on to write, I, Jeremiah, want the royal way, but there's a burning in my bones and there's a fire in my heart and hate is loose to tear apart the word one loves, the love one owns. I, Jeremiah, want the kind way, but every time I draw my breath to speak, I shout destruction, death, and I am taken with dismay. I could be silent like the stones or learn to play a quieter part, but there's a fire in my heart and a burning in my bones. So today we're going to open the book of the prophet Jeremiah to hear the word from God for us. Let us be open, not resistant to its challenge and its correction. We will read from Jeremiah 18 in a passage called Jeremiah in the Potter's House. As you're finding your Bible and turning to Jeremiah 18, let's listen as our parish adult choir sings the great hymn, How Firm a Foundation, Jamie Anderson will be our soloist.
Now turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. We begin with verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there was there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to him. And then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does, does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I intended to do to it. Now therefore say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now all of you from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. But they say it is no use. We will follow our own plans and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of our evil will. God's word for God's people. Would you pray with me? Lord, let this word for us be your word. Let this be the word by which we are taught, by which our lives are directed, and our hope is given. In the name of Christ, amen. I've heard Jeremiah in the potter's house told for as long as I can remember, told it myself more than once. In the vast majority of those tellings, it was a warm devotional message about letting God shape us and mold us into the vessels God wants us to be. One devotional that I recall told us, keep your clay moist. Keep your clay moist so God can shape you according to God's purposes for you. Keep your clay moist so that you will not be uh, resistant to the new directions God is taking your life. Keep your clay moist so that you can feel the warm, strong hands of God shaping you into the beautiful vessel you are intended to be. As the old hymn sings, melt me, mold me after thy will, while I am weighted, yielded, and still. But we have been misled. Jeremiah's words are a fiery roar designed to scare the fur off the cat and wake us up to the word of God spoken to us and about us. The next verses following the story of the potter's house are a sharp condemnation of Israel and its lack of faithfulness. Therefore, says the Lord, ask among the nations, who has heard the like of this? The virgin Israel has done a most horrible thing. Does the snow of Lebanon leave the crags of the highest mountain? Do the mountain streams decide to run dry? But my people have forgotten me. They burn offerings to a delusion. They have stumbled off the ancient roads, have gone into bypaths, not the highway, making their land a horror, a thing to be hissed at forever. All who pass by it are horrified and shake their heads like the wind from the east. I will scatter them before their enemy. I will show them my back, not my face, in the day of their calamity. Now, if Israel is clay in the potter's hands, it is not, as the song says, waiting, yielded, and still, ready to be melted and molded after God's will. It is a rebellious that is spoiling for a fight. It's about to learn the awful truth that the God who blesses can also withhold the blessing. It is about to learn that the God who helps us when we are down also expects us to live up to the Scripture's call to righteousness and justice and concern for the poor. The details are found in Jeremiah 7, where he preaches in the temple to lay out God's case against the people. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly one with another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place and the land that I gave to, of old to your ancestors forever and ever. But here you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, 
make offerings to Baal and go after other gods that you have not known and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are safe only to go on doing all those abominations has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your sight so what are we to make of this strong language from the potter's house well first God is deeply invested in our common life the potter does not work aimlessly or occasionally and neither does God God means to shape us for purposes that often exceed our vision and our imagination. Years ago at a, a different church, we had a youth director who spent a lot of time in trouble for one reason or another. He stirred up as much mischief as all the teens combined. One day I asked him if he was worried that he seemed to stay in trouble so much of the time. Oh no, he said, if you had given up on me, you'd stop trying to fix the problems. When you don't have anything to say, then I'll know that I'm really in trouble. Potters in ancient times moved the wheel by, by pushing it with their feet on a lower wheel. With their hands, they held and shaped the clay as it sat on the upper wheel. With their body leaning over the work, they put pressure on the clay to make the shape they wanted to see. Every turn of the wheel matters. It's hard work. God does not leave us a blob of clay on the wheel, God does shape us as a community, as a church, and as a nation to become what God hopes for us. Working through history and history's events, God is constantly calling the peoples of this world toward the kingdom. God is using events around us to call us to greater faithfulness. The homeless are on the streets, the homeless are hungry. Many of us wonder where they can find welcome. Others who try to use the same streets are made uncomfortable by their presence and constant panhandling. What is God calling this church to do in response to that need? Congress is considering the president's call to intervene in Syria. What responsibility does this nation have for events on the other side of the earth? How can this nation use the tools of military might to bring about good for the world's peoples and for the peoples displaced by Syria's civil war? What is, this, is God calling this church to do in response to that need? Secondly, the potter is not indifferent to the condition of the clay because the clay itself suggests the kind of vessel it might make. God knows what we're made of. God knows our limits and our possibilities. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, no testing has overtaken you. That is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Now some clay will remain strong, even when it is turned very thinly. Other clay must be kept thick to hold its shape. The potter must know the difference and work the vessel according to the character of the clay on the wheel. In the same way, God knows what we're able to endure. Some of us are young and should not be tested beyond our years. Some of us have seen quite a lot of the world and can stand to deal with situations that would leave others in shock. Some of us are physically strong and able to carry heavy loads. Others are thin and wiry and able to slip through the cracks that would stop others. Some years ago, I went to a worship service over in Asheville, North Carolina. According to the order of service, there would be two interpretive dancers in this service. The first one took the floor and her limbs were long and willowy. Her dance was flowing and beautiful. And when she finished, I thought to myself that the next dancer could not add much to that. It was so beautiful. The second dancer took the floor and she was shorter and even stocky. When her dance began, it was powerful as her, as her build was. The flowing moves of the first dancer were entirely missing, replaced by a power that spoke of struggle and overcoming. Each dancer, it turned out, was different from the other. Each dancer had a gift the other could not duplicate. Each dancer had learned to use her gifts in her dancing before the Lord. Let us take our gifts and offer them as those two dancers did to the glory of God. Thirdly, there is a point in the process of turning a pot on the wheel when its future shape is, is set. 
For communities of faith like this one, there are watershed moments when the community faces choices that will have a profound impact on our future. The choice to build on a new site or stay at the old one. The strategic choices that are represented by the annual budget. Events become defining for a congregation's self-identity. Ministries become the marquee statements for which we or any congregation are known. The engaging insight, according to Jeremiah, is that human activity and response are part of our conversation with God. Too often, we assume that there's nothing we can do to change the course of events. Others have all the cards. Others are closer to the situation. Others have the standing that we do not. And we assume that we cannot or should not do anything. Or we assume that the outcome is in the hands of forces beyond our reach. Jeremiah quoted his critics at the close of the passage, but they say it is no use. There is nothing we can do about the problems we see. Is God going to drop down out of heaven? and throw the crooks out. God's tolerance for waiting exceeds ours. We know that. Is God going to see that the situation is resolved quickly while the rest of us still remember when it could have turned out differently? In Alexander Solzhenitsyn's play, A Day or Book, in the A Day in the Life of Ivan uh, Denisovich, Ivan endures all the horrors of a Soviet prison camp. One day he is praying with his eyes closed when a fellow prisoner notices him and says with ridicule, prayers won't help you get out of here any faster. Opening his eyes, Ivan answers, I do not pray to get out of prison, but to do the will of God. Jeremiah in the potter's house insists that ours is not a far away God. The common thinking of our day is that God, if there is a God, is not going to determine the outcome of the crisis unfolding around us. It will be world leaders, military action, or even the weather that has the greater impact. But Jeremiah insists that our God is near and working through events and forces around us to work God's will. Even in days of crisis, the God who spoke to Jeremiah in the potter's house brings a word of reassurance and hope. In this time of world tension around Syria and war weariness in this nation, let us approach the present moment with the assurance of that nearby God. How does this nation or any nation act to bring about good at home and around the world? How do we pray when and then act to announce the presence of God to the weary nation? How do we bear witness to hope that comes from the confidence that God is near? Have, have you ever visited a potter's workshop? As you watched, what did God say to you in that place? As you recall that visit, let's listen as Matt and Karen Cook sing for us now. They will sing, Father, hear the prayer we offer.
As we come to the close of our time, I would like to invite you to join us for worship at Church Street. Our Sunday worship services are, on, are at 8.30 and 11 a.m. They are in the nave. It is a beautiful, holy place, and I invite you to come and join us as we share in worship in that place. Also, on Wednesday at noon, we gather in the chapel, and there we gather for Holy Communion as well as a time of prayer. I invite you to be a part of that experience as well. Well, in closing, I'm Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. Now, as I go, my wish for you, that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye, you've just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. Rejoice.